Yo, this is Flip Gordon. You're listening to the Top Rope Nation podcast. This should be played at high volume, preferably in a residential area. Ladies and gentlemen, it is no time. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I finished these fights. Give me a hell yeah. Top Rope Nation. Learn to love it. It's the best summertime is in the air if you're vince mcmahon money is flying through the air and if you're a listener of this broadcast you are about to have three heavenly voices floating through the airwaves right into your headphones this is top rope nation god damn does it feel good to say that again guys it's been a couple weeks we're back on the air who wrote that? <laughs> that's off the top of my head, man. I've heard it all now. That's that's what you get with uh, what is this episode fifty eight of the Top Rope Nation podcast. I thought I, I knew I was going to say something about summertime being in the air, and I just let the rest flow. It's well, nice, that's impressive. Out. It's nice out. We just had like the longest winter of my life. I mean, it, feel, it felt like we had snow for six months, and now it's eighty five degrees. Wife? Yeah, wow. this winter just dragged. I don't know how you felt, Justin, but this is a long winter. Yeah, it, it was it was worse than Al Snow this winter. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, man, I don't know. It, it's like we went from 20, 30 degrees to 85, like overnight. We got not really any spring, but it's definitely summertime now, and I am happy about it. Um, probably not as happy as Vince McMahon with that television contract, which we're going to talk about. So, like I said, we have been off the air a couple weeks. Kyle was overseas. We're going to have to hear about that. But we are finally back with a new episode and plenty to talk about over the next hour here. We're going to get into an abundance of topics. But first off, Kyle Ross, I got to ask you, like I just said, you were overseas. How did that trip go? Uh, I believe. Where did you go? France? Uh, Paris, Brussels, and Amsterdam. My God. <laughs> so With, with the, a the... Uh, baby as well yeah with my nine month old and my wife yeah my wife real, had to babysit two people the real question is did you come back with the european championship i did yes awesome. i did that was very good i was yeah that's good yeah the, um the best european champion since Delo brown but no it was a really good time it was good to get away and um uh you know the baby was great um the, it's you know Something that not to get too political here or something, but if an idiot like me can travel overseas like pretty easy, like I did in three different countries, um, because generally speaking, people in other countries are so accommodating to English only speaking people like myself, it makes you scratch your head when you see idiots like this guy in New York ranting and raving and hooting and hollering. In that video, I don't know how old that oh, news is, but yeah. I caught it. Yeah, you know, I mean, it made you think, you know, I mean, not to get way off topic, but, um, you know, I mean, it was easy to people like, I can't believe you travel with a baby over there. Yeah, it wasn't that hard. You know, it, it, it worked great, actually, because we had we kept her on American sleep schedule and that meant we got to stay up till midnight. <laughs> That's true. You, you flew a red eye. So, uh, hey, mm-hmm. that works. And we kept it that way the whole time, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, you're What's braver it? than I am because I have not traveled on a plane with my daughter yet, and uh, she's two, and I, I'm still not sure I can do it. She slept the whole time, pretty much. It was, um, you know, my wife. You know, if if she ever did wake up, the baby ever wake up, my wife would, you know, shove the old boob in her mouth. But uh, <laughs> that's the thing. You're still at that <laughs> stage, man. Once once they're two years old, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> that's a very good point. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, you know, and it's, but. Uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend any of those three cities. Brussels very underrated. Um, to be honest, it was kind of a throw-in that we just stopped on a train. Paris, we did all the tourist stuff. We missed all the WWE folks uh, by a couple days. Sucked, you know. We uh, took our pictures at the Eiffel Tower. I think the day before Seth Rollins and Ronda Rousey and that big group did. And uh, you know, Amsterdam certainly was as, as good as advertised. That was the one. Maybe I was like, eh, damn it, you know, it sucks to be toting around a nine month old around here i wouldn't mind getting after it a little harder but it was okay i still <laughs> yeah did you get any good belgian beer yes the beer i you know the first day i was there 
um, you know, we go to a bar and I had like two beers and we walk out. I'm like, fuck, man, I'm feeling good. <laughs> and my wife's like, you know, all the beer here is like 10 percent. I'm like, wow, that explains it. So, um, yeah, it's I, I, that that was why it was so over or uh, kind of under the radar for me. I didn't really kind of know what I was getting into. And it, it was sweet. Well, I do have to tell you, I am a quarter Belgian. And oh, I have wow. never been there, and so I'm I'm pretty jealous. I'd love to go there for the beer culture. Uh, I got to ask you. I'm not sure what city it's in in, in Belgium, but I've seen pictures. Um, it, yeah, I just looked it up. It is in Brussels. Did you happen to see the world famous statue called the Mannequin P? Yep, we took uh, pictures uh, with our baby, kind of like lifting up. You know, uh, th- there's a Mister and a Mrs. now too. There, there's a second one. We, oh, we wow. got them both. Yeah, well, they just piss you. People, they crowded that thing. Yeah. <laughs> For you guys that don't know what we're talking about, is a statue of a little boy taking a piss. The mannequin pee. Yeah. I went to a museum, learned all about the history. There you go. Yeah. And so, then, Am- yeah, Amsterdam, you know, <laughs> hung out. You know, I was like the most tourist. We were hung out in Club 420. What a fine establishment that is over there. I really can't recommend <laughs> that enough. This, this definitely sounds like the kind of trip for a nine-month-old man. Hardcore. Well, they, 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 <laughs> they, at that point, I was dropped off. And yeah. Stuff like that. As, I, I, as I told my as I told my daycare professionals this afternoon, they're like, "Oh man, you took because we were like, oh yeah, we were taking her in the bars everywhere." They're like, "You took her in the bars in Amsterdam?" I'm like, "Well, no, you know, I mean, you know, those ones I went in by myself, but you know, it was great." You know? <laughs> and across town over there, Justin Joints. Um, let's see, I looked it up. <laughs> Justin <laughs> Joints. <laughs> Very apropos there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Uh, la- let's see. The last time we talked was May 3rd. And uh, Justin and I had planned on doing maybe some solo shows while Kyle was gone. And that first week went by. And we were just kind of like, we didn't really know what to talk about. There wasn't a lot going on in wrestling. The shows weren't very good. It was just before All In sold out, I believe. And so we were texting. And we're like, ah, I'm not really sure what to talk about. We'll just put it off a week. We didn't end up doing a show. And here we are 19 days later, finally. Hopefully, you guys that tune into the podcast are still tuning in and listening to me right now. We are giving a, away a T-shirt later in the podcast. So if you're one of the people that entered, keep listening. We're going to do that drawing here in a little bit. Uh, but, Justin, how are you doing, man? I haven't talked to you either. Uh, I'm good. Uh, we've reached a... Uh pretty significant sleep regression with uh my my little roman range junior um so i'm i'm super tired but uh i hey i'm ready to talk about our siblings for the next hour (laughs) my brother just left the house actually is maybe we should start a spinoff podcast top rope dads or something because (laughs) we could go on and on about children and parenting and it might be pretty damn entertaining but half our listeners right now probably more than half are like, would you guys just shut the hell up and get to the pro graps? But how can we not how can we not talk about these things going on in our lives? And how can we not talk about professional wrestling and what a last week we've had? Let's just go right to the the Fox story. My God, Vince McMahon, as Kyle would say, has done it again. One billion dollars for SmackDown to Fox Sports. What what were your initial reactions upon hearing this? Because you guys heard it first. I saw it in the text thread that we have ongoing. Uh, Kyle, what'd you think when you saw that news? I mean, there were rumors that it was going to be big. So it wasn't like I started like, you know, just flailing all over the room saying, holy fucking shit, I can't believe what I just read. But that being said, when it's there and reported and you think about the history of the industry, I mean, there's just no way to sugarcoat or I just uh, should say there's just no way to overstate is what I should say. Uh, What a big deal this is. I mean, this is over $1 billion. I understand even to be on network TV for five years. I mean, that is an incredible achievement for a pro wrestling company, even one as big and, you know, with history of success as WWE, it's remarkable when you consider how much money they've already brought in for 2019 and the year hasn't started. Um, you know, I think all the people who like to complain and, you know, we'll complain on this podcast sometimes about, you know, the quality of the creative direction of the company. I think, you know, 
we need to take a step back. I know I've been kind of thinking about this a lot the last couple of days and how we truly evaluate pro wrestling in the present day, because there's just, you could say what you want about WWE, but they're at an all time high right now, man. I mean, you know, defying success, however you want, they're successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may not like who they push. You can, there's legit criticisms of the company, but my God, I mean, they just got a billion dollars for one of their two. I mean, that's not even including what they're going to get for raw from NBC universal. And you throw in this money they got from Saudi Arabia. I mean, they're raking it in. No company in the history of this industry has ever been as successful, even close to the successful. So the, the financials for raw haven't been revealed. Is that right? I haven't seen a figure on that. No, I mean, they're rumored to be, I thought it was like 439 million. I thought it per, was per year. Uh, no total. Oh, total. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, raw Fox had overpay to get it. Yeah. Um, I think so, but it may be more. I think, or is that the current deal? I can't, I, I don't have to look it up, but still, I mean, it's going to be insane mm-hmm. when all said and done. Well, it certainly doesn't give them any reason to shake up their creative. <laughs> that's that's, that's know, the negative people, side, but. Well, but people say that, but man, I mean, you can't, they're not going to go to Fox and like produce a shitty show. I mean, whether or not, I mean, when people say that, whether it means, well, are they going to start pushing your favorites? I don't know, but they're not going to like, to like, just have a phoned in show yeah. now that they got this money. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Fox is probably going to be, at least at the outset, is probably going to be paying pretty close attention. I've got to imagine. I mean, when you invest that kind of dollar amount, certainly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Justin, what are your reactions? Uh, hopeful for uh, what it means for the product. Um, my wife was actually just asking me tonight, like, uh, in a very general term, where is wrestling at compared to other times in its in its life and i told her i mean we're in we're in another boom period um uh, wwe just tripled their tv contract i mean it's uh professional wrestling is as healthy as it's you know possibly ever been it, 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 maybe not compared to like the hulk hogan stone cold eras but overall it's it's much better than i think it's ever been and we should talk about it's not just WWE right now when Justin says that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're looking at the all in show. So I mean, if you're somebody who's like wants to just move goalposts and poo poo WWE, that's fine. But I mean, you've got an option. They just with again, and this goes back to how I say we need to reevaluate how we evaluate pro wrestling in 2018. You know, people keep talking, oh, you know, this guy, the guy who does the re- reviews for, or did, I guess, the reviews for Raw now uh, at uh Meltzer site that Hamlin was like pissing and moaning and he, he kind of always did a lousy job anyway to be blunt <laughs> shots but, fired <laughs> yeah I mean he did I mean it was not good I mean it was a clear downgrade right away from Todd Martin it just kept getting worse but he was like oh I preferred when they were making stars and stuff like that well man you're missing the point like okay if you think it's necessary to make stars to make money well that's fine but they just made a whole lot of money Mm-hmm. Not doing it your way. And by the way, all in with no matches announced, essentially sold out in 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, that's the thing is we're, we're beyond the stars days. Like we don't need, you know, WWE doesn't need one or two big guys. Like, you know what happens with rental WrestleMania next year? If uh, let's say John Cena, Undertaker, Brock Lesnar, Rock Romans, if they're not there, it still sells out, you know. Yes. Yeah, the brand is the star now. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting when you guys are talking about the boom period stuff because it definitely is a boom period as far as financials go, no question about it. And I thought Daniel Bryan, uh, he was on Jericho's podcast recently. And I was listening to that while mowing the lawn, and he talked about how. <laughs> Hold on, can I butt in? <laughs> yeah. How much of wrestling podcasts? benefited mowing the lawn oh my god i I always say that like i i listen to so many more podcasts in the summer months than i do like the rest of the year just because i'm outside for hours and i'm just listening constantly but like when i'm working and then i'm just around the house when it's cold out i just don't listen to them as much 
So I'm, I'm hoping our numbers spike this summer, by the way. Tell your friends, guys. If you like Top Rope Nation, spread the word. This is the best wrestling podcast you have never heard of. That's going to be our tag time, our tag line, I should say. Um, no, but when uh, when Jericho and Brian were talking about it, uh, Brian said, you know, there's less fans now than there were at those other points, uh, but like the fans are more serious than they were at those points. And I think that's kind of an interesting point because like the fans now in pro wrestling are so immersed in the product as far yes. as like consuming everything that's yes. out there. Like we had Flip Gordon on the show um, a couple months ago and he said he you can't consider yourself a pro wrestling fan in 2018 unless you subscribe to like two or three streaming services. That, that was his words. But I think there's a lot of people out there that do have multiple streaming services. And you can see wrestling instantly from all over the world. It's got like this cult-like following. Um, way less, yeah, way less fans than like than the year 1999 or 2000. But the fans that are there eat it up. And they're driving the revenue. And they're driving up the prices for television contracts. Because they know this is a hardcore following like few brands have. So Yeah, I- no, you hit on it. Now, I, this was something I wanted to bring up later too. The key, what Fox, I, I don't know. I'm not in the room. I'm not a TV executive. But what I think has to make WWE so attractive to something like Fox. First of all, you know they've got this strategy of acquiring a ton of live programming already. We know that. But with wrestling, you kind of hit the nail on the head, Ryan. It has got a. We could talk about how maybe the ceiling's never been lower in terms of fan base for wrestling. Conversely, the floor has never been higher at any time in pro wrestling. And what I mean by that is, you know, people poo-poo these ratings. They talk about these ratings. Man, there's just a baseline number that WWE will never drop below, no matter what they do. And it's pretty high. It's never been higher. Like, I mean, there's, you know, you go back to like the mid-90s. I mean, it was like nobody watching right now. I mean... Remember when W SmackDown was like the second most watched show the night of that Trump Clinton debate? Mm-hmm. Like that's what I mean. That's what's got to make them attractive to a network like Fox. In that, you know, WWE, it's just there's a certain number of people that no matter what are always going to watch it, and that makes it a very attractive property. Yeah, it's. I was kind of thinking this relative to like professional sports the other day, and how I feel following my pro sports teams, and like. I consider myself a really, really hardcore like MLB, NFL, NBA fan. But like when my teams are god awful, kind of like the Bulls right now, <laughs> I like I still follow it. But like I don't find myself as drawn to it. Like when the team is down, like just the mm-hmm. NBA in general, just because like the Bulls are terrible. I'd like to see them do well. I still watch it, but it it doesn't like draw me in when my team's down. Like wrestling does all the time and i've had these periods where i'm not watching it as closely and you got i know you guys have too because we've talked about that in the past but like you still go online and you still check out kind of what's going on like you can't get away from it it's like if if you're a fan like if you're a fan in 2018 it's i know people that that hate the current product but they always follow it like they know exactly what's going on yeah, it's like if you hate it so much, man, you sure do know a lot about it. Like for me, if I don't like something, like I just don't pay any attention to it. Mm-hmm. And so like, number one, I don't hate the current product, first of all, first and foremost, obviously. But, you know, yeah, I, I just think that um, because it, it, it works both ways. Like I think a cat, the number of casual wrestling fans like we've all been kind of saying here the last five minutes has probably never been lower it's hard it's probably got to be you know like I, I had a buddy who told me man it, it's kind of a lot of work to watch all this wrestling when you think about it. i mean it's five hours yeah. over the last two nights and that's you know a night where there was no pay-per-view on sunday if there's a pay-per-view on sunday and they're talking about expanding those to four hours so by the way i mean that's nine hours you're watching the tube over a three-day span that's a lot um and certainly that kind of investment is going to turn people off, but there is a large number of people who are going to do it, us included, and that is what makes WWE so attractive. 
You know, they can produce all this hours. People could talk about oversaturation all they want in the product. There is an oversaturation with the product. There's no doubt about it in my mind. But people watch. Yeah, it sucks you in. You can't get away from it. You can't get away. If you if you've been a wrestling fan for years, even if you try to not, you're still gonna you're still gonna check out what's going on. And people yeah. always have this casual interest that have been hardcore fans. I shouldn't say casual interest because, like you said, the casual fans aren't there. But if you followed it for any period of time, like seriously, everyone always kind of checks in, even if even if they're disgruntled with the project for, with the product. And I don't think Friday is gonna matter at all for SmackDown. People are like, oh, Friday. People are going to watch it. People like me, I, I, you know, I, I don't watch Raw live during football season because I'm on NFL football, unless the game like sucks. But, um, you know, I, I just, but Friday for me is fine, and I think for most people it's going to be fine too. Didn't they tried this before? Didn't they with SmackDown having it on Friday nights? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it was clearly the B show. That's the difference. Like it was not. You know, I, I believe at that time we were still technically in the brand split era, but guys were appearing on both shows, and SmackDown was very, very much a B show, mm-hmm. and not. Yeah. And in this case, there's going to be far greater effort put into the program than there was in like 2009. Yeah, and that's you know that's the thing is uh. I don't know how much Fox cares about like actual time ratings because that's going to be one of those things where I probably won't be able to watch it on Friday nights, but I will certainly watch it on DVR. You know, we, we live in that age now where it it doesn't really matter if you'll, you know, happen to watch it right that night. It will get watched. It will have eyeballs. Well, yeah, I did that with raw. I didn't want, you know, cause the calves were on last night, so I didn't watch it. I I watched uh, the first like half hour live. And then I just, you know, I watched a little bit after the game and then, um, cause I was in a good mood and then I watched I'm, the rest of tonight. Or yeah, this I'm, morning. Gonna, I'm gonna need you to not bring up the calves again in this, in this podcast. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah. This is amazing. So the first year we start the podcast, the Cubs and Indians play in the world series. And now we've got this ongoing rivalry now between the Cavs and Celtics the last couple of years between you guys. It's mm-hmm. amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Let's see how that shakes out. But yeah, it, it's what's also going to be amazing is to see the promotion WWE gets because they're going to be getting advertisements. You're going to have Joe Buck reading advertisements. Yeah, a NFL lot games. of people are. Been, <laughs> a lot of people are saying how they can't wait to hear Joe Buck. You know, grit his teeth and have to do a <laughs> WWE promo. Yeah, so they they will certainly benefit from that um, exposure. It right and, Friday night is not a bad. Or it I should say it is a bad night as far as ratings go. It's it, it is hard to draw people in on Friday nights. There's no doubt yeah, about it. But the they're gonna night. yeah, but they're it's gonna the they're gonna have great promotion. They're gonna be on network television, so they should have decent numbers still. And the the actual TV ratings, man. First of all, that shit was overrated even in the Monday Night Wars era. Just ask Eric Bischoff, but. <laughs> You know, it's even more overrated now, like what the actual rating is. I mean, people, you know, like Meltzer would every, oh, you know, TV's the end all be all for this company. These ratings, you know, when they're up for a new TV deal, we'll see. Well, we saw (laughs) and they got a billion dollars for one of the shows. Yeah. I mean, they're still one of the highest rated shows in cable. All all together, cable TV ratings are down and they're still one of the top ones. They're nowhere close to where they were several years ago, but they're still one of the top ones. Um, so I mean, it does matter as far as like ad rates go and and TV contracts. And like Kyle said, uh, they got a boatload of money, so they're doing all right there. And people who may not follow this, who don't follow the NFL or anything, Fox got Thursday night NFL. So being on Friday night is huge in that regard because they're going to get advertising. I bet at least initially, like out the ass mm-hmm. from on Thursday night football. Aren't they supposedly looking at getting rid of Thursday night football in the long run? I thought I'd heard it. Thursday night football is three hour raws. They ain't getting rid of it. Everyone thinks that's too much, but they ain't getting rid of them, man. Yeah, I thought I thought just because the quality of the games was suffering, there was some talk. Well, I mean, the players were complaining. I mean, but you know, like I said, you know, 
people <laughs> complain about three hour raws. I don't think those are going anywhere either. That's true. Yeah. One of the one of the differences is though that the the players in the NFL actually have a union, unlike the. Yes. professional wrestlers that could pay a, play a role justin go ahead I, I i just really want to see either uh daniel bryan or shinsuke nakamura rename their finisher take a knee mm. oh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. hey what did you guys think of that main event by the way tonight because uh that was very good yeah. smackdown was very good tonight i thought overall We're, i thought it was a, i agree yeah i thought it was a good strong show, show. Yeah, we're recording this right after SmackDown has gone off the air Tuesday night. We usually record on Thursdays, but uh, push it up a little bit this week to get some content out there for all the listeners. And uh, I also agree. I thought it was a good show. Uh, I wasn't necessarily looking forward to the Jeff hardy Brian match all that much, but it proved to be a pretty damn good match. Yeah, now we get Daniel Bryan, Samoa Joe. I'm staring here at my ROH DVD collection here that I've got... Uh right to my left and uh man after that show i kind of wanted to put on old fight of the century when uh, brian and joe went at it in 2006 there oh, yeah. that's an incredible match yeah I'll, I'll tell you what um looking at wrestlemania and then uh the greatest royal rumble i i am really really digging this aj styles shinsuke nakamura feud I, it it's Started off a little iffy, but I think it's gotten to a really good place. I think each match has gotten significantly better, and and it's certainly a, a WWE style feud and matches, and it's certainly not the uh, New Japan style, but it, it's so good. I, Shinsuke is just a, a next level heel. Mm-hmm. Okay. See. Until tonight, I was underwhelmed, but tonight's segment was very good. I thought tonight's segment was the best thing they've done in the entire feud by far. And I thought it was the most, af- well, I, it was probably, I think you could say, the most effective Nakamura's come across as heel, certainly. Um, I have not been in love with the matches, necessarily. No, me either. I think I think well, that's, the, that's the odd thing, is that the matches haven't been that good as far as what they're capable of, but the story around it has been very good. And they've had some good segments surrounding the matches, but the matches haven't specifically delivered like people want them to quite yet. Well, anytime you kind of build a match around kicking each other in the dick, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> yeah. like, I, I think in gen- just if you look at the matches outside of the dick kicks, they, they've been pretty good. At least, like I said, they've gotten better each time out and, uh, I think we might be in for hopefully something special at Money in the Bank. Yeah, doing the last man standing gimmick. I mean, they finally should go all out, and it'll be interesting too to see. Do they carry it over? Because the July pay per view is Extreme Rules. So do they carry the feud? I mean, they could do it even with a title change. Um. So I mean, you could see this. That them still have two more pay per view matches in the cards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I thought the segment tonight was really good too. There was kind of some bad comedy in the middle of it, but then the brawl afterwards really pulled it back, and the brawl was you know awesome. What? That pillow fight thing could have died. Like that was kind of stupid, but the crowd actually like bought into it, and it was like like they reacted to it. So. Yeah, it was like the opposite I, reaction I'm, of what they wanted. <laughs> Just funny. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I I laughed when he said pillow fight. I was for it. I was, I was like, you know what? Let's make it a bra and panties at match at the same time. Yeah, I, I thought that was kind of lame, but I I thought the brawl afterwards was awesome, and then you once they did the ten count, you could see the last man standing thing coming, which had been yes, the rumor. That- and yeah, and you're right because it was a rumor. You kind of expected, but that was a really good way to get the gimmick of the match over. Like that's pretty old school. Yeah. You know, the heel lays the baby face out for ten seconds, and he says, "Okay, well, I just did that, and now that's going to be the match." That that was very effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm stunned. Justin hasn't brought up the Good Brothers being the <laughs> number one contenders for the tag titles. By the way. <laughs> Yeah, they they couldn't go back to the Usos yet again. They had to do something different. Yeah, I feel bad. Yeah, it's it's not going anywhere. That's why I don't bring it up. I, I okay. wish it would. I wish they'd do something interesting, but I know it's not going anywhere. So, okay. 
can we just get put some cards on the table here? Are, are the Bludgeon Brothers good? One of them is. Yeah, that that's what I'm saying. But as an act, is that act good? Because <laughs> I feel that they've really devalued the Usos at the expense of getting the Bludgeons over. And you're right; they couldn't go back to the Usos for another title match. Um, it was a good match, by the way. I thought um, it was like probably the best match the Good Brothers have got. Not based on lack of ability, but just I guess you know they kind of kind of got a spot to shine and i thought the match was quite good tonight but um you know i'm not sure the bludgeon brothers are over at all really and i'm not sure that there's not a lot better options although you read these things about how wwe views tag team wrestling right now um which makes you wonder why each brand has to have a division but um uh, are they really I, I get that it works on paper, the Bludgeon Brothers, but in practice, is is this good? We we are a hundred percent not the demographic for the Bludgeon Brothers. What do you mean by that? They, they are not being put out there for us. It, it's definitely for a younger crowd. Is it? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. It's it's either to scare younger, you know. Wrestling fans, or I don't get that. I just get that there's just like a standard monster team, like kind of. I I just I don't know. I just don't think it's. I don't think it's been particularly effective, to be honest yeah. with you. It it's a modern day natural disasters, only with a higher work rate. <laughs> I I agree with Justin. I think it is kind of to scare kids a little bit. Um, I liked the Bludgeon Brothers for the first few months quite a bit actually was very very high on them but i kind of feel like it's an act with a shelf life and once they got the title like the build to them getting the titles i thought was really good as they kind of had a slow build like they were destroying Mm -hmm. destroying local talent and then they'd have the face-offs on the ramp you know with the usos and the new day and everything i loved all of that i thought that was really good but now that they've got the titles it's kind of lost its steam well, the, the the problem is they really don't have fresh challengers. They've beat the Usos to death. They've beat the New Day. You know, I, I guess, like, when Sanity comes up, I mean, I guess that's your fresh challengers, but mm-hmm. I don't know how much I love that. Yeah, that's, that's the issue with spreading the tag teams thin and having two divisions, I guess. So I I would much rather have just one tag team division. We talked about that when they initially did the draft, but yeah, there's not a lot of options out there. You talk about squashing local talent, by the way, not to just totally pivot away, but uh, I think we're, that's all the bludgeon brothers merit. Um, I love the all squash tonight. That elbow was sick. Oh yeah. That he gave Mm -hmm. the jobber. And then, you know, um, I thought that was, another effective segment there there just wasn't a bad segment i didn't i felt on smackdown um i even like popped when lana won <laughs> i was tonight. i was going to throw that one out there the lana you know like but it was short it, it was short yeah cuz that's why you know I, it was inoffensive there just really wasn't anything bad i don't think on um, so i'm trying to think if there was something uh the, that well they had the iconics match yeah well no that was against lana yeah yeah i oh, yeah, what I wanted to say with that is, what do you guys think of the Iconics? Because I'm not sure I'm liking this the way it's going. I I find their segments pretty cringeworthy, <laughs> personally. And I, I want to get your take on that. I, I'll, throw it to, I'll, I'll just say this real quick and throw it to Justin. I cannot tell if they're really good or absolutely awful. I yeah. cannot figure it out. I, I, I texted that to a buddy. This morning, I'm like, I just don't know if the iconics are really great or really awful. I, I think that's the perfect review of the iconics. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. Like, I, I really liked him in NXT. I, I really like Peyton Royce as a heel. Um, but, like, I don't know. Something about, they kind of changed her look a lot when she came up. I'm not talking about the surgery, but like the, the haircut and everything and, I 
I don't know. I just I just find the segments they do with the annoying mic work just flat out annoying. I don't I don't find it very entertaining at all. I well, I think it's supposed to be. I think the issue is, and we see this with a lot of folks in WWE, they've got the shtick down, but they're given poor material. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that could be an issue. Yeah, what it might be because it seems like okay, you know, kind of doing the mean girl shtick that it's a good idea, but you're right. Sometimes they say stuff and you're like, ugh. Like they they had that one segment. Was it? The night of backlash, when like Booker T looked like he wanted to like transport himself like away from the entire segment. God bless Booker T. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, by the way, can we get him back on Raw? You know, I when I, I'm catching up on two weeks of WWE programming, what's the first thing I text you guys? Jonathan Coachman, is oh, fucking yes. idiots. Yes, he yes. is. It, it was so bad. At one point, I was like, "Is he worse than Steve McMichael was in the early days of Nitro?" <laughs> Like, he is so bad. Like, he says things that are either wrong or make no sense. Yeah. Well, I don't think McMichael talked as much as he does, which makes him worse. <laughs> it's, well, McMichael did. McMichael would just get confused and would yeah. just say just very generic things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Make lame football analogies. <laughs> Hell of a football player, though. Hell of a football oh, player. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... Uh... Yeah, I'm not not a huge fan of of the coach either. Um, we guess I think uh, I was gonna mention. I lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, okay. So the other kind of low point I thought on the show was the Naomi match with uh, Sonya Deville. Yeah, that wasn't very good. It yeah. was it was kind of inoffensive. I, it was a money in the bank qualifier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's I don't know that was that to me that was a low point, but the rest of the show was was pretty damn good. Um, Raw, what would you guys think of Raw? I thought Raw was average. I liked Raw more than most people. Obviously, there was one notable bad segment that I'm sure we'll get into. But I actually liked it more than I think most people did. I liked the. I thought the first hour was good. I thought the main event was good. And I thought the Ronda Nia contract signing with Stephanie delivering a great performance uh, was good. Yeah, that's that's the main uh, component I wanted to talk about with Ronda kind of being thrust into this title match so quickly, um, and with Nia and what we think about what's going to happen there, and what we think about as far as I'm putting it, Rousey in that situation this early. But I guess the way that this has played out, it, it seems like they didn't really have much of a choice. Um, but it is. It's a little awkward because of how Nia has been built up over the last month to uh, to be in this match with Rousey now. But uh, what do you guys think of the of the direction of that match? There, there's going to be some shenanigans when it comes to that match. There's no, I, I can't imagine with how Ronda came in talking about how she wants to earn it, and now she's had one match which was great. Uh, and then she gets a title match. There's going to be something going on with either, you know, maybe Natalia running in or cashing in or something. Um, but I'm not opposed to it. I, I, I think it's actually maybe a, a good stepping stone for maybe making Nia something more, whether that be a heel or a face. I mean, it, it should be. It's interesting. Worst case scenario, it, it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. It very much seems like this was not an original idea. You know, it, it seems like somebody just kind of came up with, oh, well, let's just put Ron in a title match. And, you know, I, I was reading things like, well, they didn't want to go another pay per view with Ronda, you know, and they didn't really have anything else. So they kind of know it's early, but they're going to say fuck it and do it anyway. <laughs> If any of that, and you got to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt, obviously, because you don't know what's accurate and what's not. But, man, if that's true, that's a head scratcher for me. How, when you bring someone like Ronda Rousey and a star of that caliber, how do you not have a six to nine to 12 month story arc yeah. written? 
you know, like to me, I, it caught me off guard because the way they were building things, I'm like, I thought they were going to do something. Granted, this is not going to, you know, knock anyone's socks off. But I was thinking, well, OK, she tags with Natty against like Alexa Bliss and Mickey James. Yeah. And that's the match. And again, that's not like, you know, that's not a big as big a deal as her going for the title against Nia Jax. It's. I think more logical and, and, and you can, you know, just do something where, okay, you can have Rhonda and Natty win. You can have Natty turn on, right. You could just do things that are logical and make sense and keep, keep her away from the title. But if they want her in the title picture, I don't know. Like Justin said, it is intriguing what they do. I obviously Stephanie's going to be involved. Um, they very much do want to make this, I think the female Austin Vince. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm. I I can see the Natty cash in. A lot of people were talking about that last night, where Ronda beats Nia, um, and then Natty has already won the briefcase earlier in the night, and then you know she comes down to congratulate her and turns on her because we all have to assume that, that Natty's turning heel on Ronda. Mm-hmm. I, I genuinely hope the whole uh, making Ronda, you know, seem like the Stone Cold works better than. How making Roman Reigns look like Daniel Bryan or Stone Cold does? Yeah. Well, I think it. I mean, people have taken to her. I mean, it's it, there's just no backlash against her. Smiling Ronda, the people love her. <laughs> does that surprise us at all? Did we think there was gonna be a backlash just from her being an outsider and, and getting a strong push? Because I think a lot of people probably thought there would be a backlash to her. But yeah, man. but WrestleMania, WrestleMania ended that. I mean, that's old news. I mean, WrestleMania ended that. Yeah, discussion. Yeah. I mean, she's fine. She's made at this point. Yeah, uh, us three cheering her at WrestleMania made her. <laughs> You're welcome, Ronda Rousey. We were there. We made it happen. Yeah, it's. I, I have seen some reports saying things like, "Oh, she might not be ready for a singles match." So there's oh, gonna. No. I mean, there's gonna be some intrigue as far as how the match goes, but. Uh, I think she'll be fine. She wrestled on the European tour. And um, look, they're going to put, <laughs> you would think, I shouldn't say because you never know, but they're going to put a lot of creative effort into that match. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, kind of like WrestleMania. That was the report out was they were working well, they on that for I mean, weeks and weeks and weeks. Now, if it's true that this was kind of a late in the game change, I mean, certainly they're not going to have as much practice here. Yeah. And, you know, Naya is not. Triple H and Kurt Angle, obviously, who can really hold a match together and and whatnot. But I think it'll be fine. I, I really do. And intriguing. I'm very intrigued what they go with. It's not an easy call what they're going to do with that, except that Stephanie gets involved somehow. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd like to see Nia turn heel. I think she'll work better as a as a heel. And to me, the intrigue they, is: do they pivot in both women's divisions? Like completely here and have two new champions and one show like they could completely reset both women's divisions in one night Asuka and Ronda Rousey I can't see them just going back to Asuka like that I don't think so either but I'm intrigued to see if they do that that would be crazy that would show like not much faith in Nia or, or Carmella you would think they would kind of hold this out till SummerSlam at least for one of them but uh... with Nia, the thing that's head scratching is they did put so much work into getting her over as a baby face and that Alexa feud. Mm-hmm. It would kind of then seem like a waste just to then turn her heel. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, they don't there, there's uh, other than Alexa, there's a real dearth of like heel women on the raw brand. I mean, I get you, you do have, uh, you know, the riot squad, but, um, I don't think they WWE sees that as a title program, you know, Nia against the right. Cause it, it was kind of a logical option after Ruby won uh, against Bailey mm-hmm. at backlash. You know, a lot of people are like, okay, is Nia Ruby the next step now? Yeah, obviously not. <laughs> I so thought when they started this storyline with the bullying that, it just seems too obvious that Nia would be the heel eventually, but I thought that Alexa and Nia thing was going to drag on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and that eventually it would be revealed that, in fact, Nia actually is a bully, and that Alexa was telling the truth the entire time. That's what I thought was going to happen, or how it was going to play out. 
I was. We wrong. get a Nia Jax. This is your life with people <laughs> coming back. <so. laughs> I don't know. We get the old uh, what was it? The GTV, the hidden cameras backstage showing <laughs> showing what yeah. she's really like. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it, it just people were digging Nia, but I think it was a thing where it was the feud that was working. Remember, I think a few weeks ago somebody at you know wrote in. We had a question. You know, is Champa like? the best heel in the business or something or the best heel of the modern era. And we're like, well, you know, is it him or is it the feud? Yeah. You know, I, I think I, I remember us talking about that. And with Naya, it's like, okay, well, she had a successful feud to turn her baby face, but now what? And I think they're struggling with the now what? Mm-hmm. So they went with this. Yeah. Well, speaking of going with this, we're going to go with this t-shirt giveaway right now. Oh wait, we're not going to talk about Bobby Lashley's sisters. We got to talk about. Oh Bobby no, we, we're going to. We're going to come back. Okay. We're going to come back. We got okay. some more topics, but I want to get this handled here. So, um, if you're listening for the T-shirt giveaway, if you're one of the handful of people that entered, and all you guys had to do, by the way, I tweeted this out multiple times. It is no joke. We are sending a free Top Rope Nation T-shirt to whoever wins this drawing. Um, all we ask you to do is go on iTunes, leave us a rating. And a comment with your Twitter profile name in it, and you were entered in the contest to get a free Top Rope Nation t-shirt from our store, which you can find at shop.spreadshirt.com slash Top Rope Nation. And so I do have, I found a website where I can put in the names, and it's like a Wheel of Fortune deal. And so I'm actually oh my going, God. Yeah, I am actually going to film this on my phone so that I can post this on the twitter account later if people think this is not legit there All are right. no frozen envelopes here <laughs> there are no frozen envelopes so i am queuing up the game right now and i am going to record live here on tuesday night our t-shirt giveaway uh, all the people that entered are here, and I am going to spin the wheel and we are going to see who Make wins the deal. yeah so it is spinning and our winner is kyle Kyle R four one three is his uh, username. So Kyle, if you're listening, get a hold of us on Twitter. Um, send us a tweet. Let us know which shirt from the store you want. Let us know your size, and we will get that in the mail. So thanks for all of you that entered. We will do this again, and uh, pretty easy way to get a, a new T-shirt. So and I assure you that was not me, by the way, Kyle. A very odd. No, it Kyle is not. R. <laughs> yes, no. Yes, I actually entered. I was that desperate for it. Yeah, <laughs> for it. Yeah, I actually, that is funny. I no, actually, it's not Kyle Ross. It is a different yeah. Kyle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Kyle already. This Kyle Ross. This Kyle. He he already has uh, a few of our, at least one of our yeah. t-shirts. So I was wearing one over in Europe. There you go. All right. So at Kyle R four one three, get a hold of us on Twitter, and we'll get that taken care of. Um, all right, so back to the wrestling here as we head into the home stretch on the show this week. I did want to talk about this. I've been seeing this discussed a lot on Twitter and the wrestling message boards and everything that I oh. lurk on from time to time. Uh, maybe it's not going to be as big of an issue tonight after that stellar main event and the, and the face-off with Joe and Daniel Bryan. But what do we think, Kyle, about the use of Daniel Bryan since his return to the ring? Do we think they've done a... A good job, a poor job, um, because I've I've had some talks with some of my friends on this, and some people I know are pretty down on it. Others are, uh, you know, this is about the best they can do. He's kind of, you know, touch and go still with his health. Um, other people, you gotta you gotta move him back kind of slowly to being a main eventer. What do you think? Has his return lived up to the hype for you, Kyle? Um. He's the only guy on the roster that I, you know, I think Justin one time, I can't remember if we were off air, asked me, oh, do you like, do you actually have favorites or whatever? And, you know, to me, I, my answer is always like, I just, you know, I just root for good wrestling. I don't root for any individuals. But Daniel Bryan is kind of the exception. I always find myself rooting for Daniel Bryan. And it certainly helps that, in my opinion, he's the best, you know, for a little long portrait of time was the best overall performer in the world. And I think can get back there. I have no problem with the way he's been presented. I think he's been presented very strong, quite frankly. Uh, you know, you know, people who want to talk about all oh, WWE, big men, fetish, yada, yada, yada. Dana Bryan made big cast tap and was put over huge at backlash. Um, he was put over very strong at WrestleMania. 
yeah, he lost to Rusev, but don't people want Rusev to get pushed? Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I don't think that matters. He came back, he won tonight. Um, where they go with this for the pay-per-view, I could see big casts interfering and them doing another Brian cast match, which I'm not crazy about because um, the way that backlash match was booked, man, is there no storyline reason to do another? I know they were like, okay, well, Brian won, but you know, cast did the unspeakable thing of attacking him afterwards. It's like, yeah, okay. You know, like Brian brought up, I think like the next week, he's like, well, I did win the match by the way. And that, I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but I know I have no problem with it. I mean, I don't know what people expect. I mean, do you do they want him to be the champion already? Um, I, I don't think that would I, I think there you should build to that. Um, certainly seeing Daniel Bryan wrestle every week is a treat, I think. So uh, I've had I've had no real problem with it at all. He's he gets big reactions. He's you know, him versus Miz is the biggest match. The SmackDown brand has, and I'm intrigued how they get there. Mm-hmm. So, is, no, I'm fine with it. Is it still like weird or surreal to you guys anytime you watch a Brian match? Because I like yeah. just see it, see, seeing the match tonight starting with Jeff Hardy. I was like, God, I just none of this seems real yet. That's an interesting point because, yeah, some people are like, oh, it doesn't feel, you know, you know, I guess some people have the feeling, well, Daniel Bryan's wrestling again, whatever. I guess Daniel Bryan just wrestles all the time now. And, you know, that's what Daniel Bryan wants. Yeah. So, um, yeah, okay, there's an argument that in the old days, all right, yeah, fine. He, he hasn't wrestled a long time. You, you space these matches out. But <laughs> when you got all these hours to fill, man, you, it's tough to do that sometimes. Yeah. I think I'm I'm always kind of like browsing the internet to see like what the hot button topics are that people are arguing about and this this is one of them I've seen out there the last couple of weeks when we weren't recording so I wanted to touch on it but I think I got the sense from a lot of people they feel like Brian's already just just a guy but my thought is you can't What is that like, What does that mean just you know, exactly. cuz we, we we go back to that and it's like you know people just want these guys like to be just lark, you know, and there is an argument. I, I get it that, um, you know, people pay to see stars, uh, but Daniel Bryan is a star. He's a made guy. I mean, unless if they just beat him like a drum, like 10 weeks in a row, he's going to stay a made guy. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's the thing is I'm way more interested in the story that even he's telling where it's like, he's even saying like, yeah, no, I am not at a certain level that I should be. That's the, that's the interesting story. Not him hulking up all of a sudden. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You can't, you have to tell the story of him, like to, to to quote Rocky three, getting back the eye of the tiger kind of thing. Like he's not, he can't come back after three years and automatically win the world title. He's been gone. He was, you know, in a suit week in and week out as on SmackDown. Um, You have to build up to him winning the title. You can't do it right away. And I don't know what else they're really supposed to do. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not putting him in the main event against uh, Styles or Nakamura right away, which would be, people would complain about that too because they'd say, where's the story? Why is he getting a title match all the way? So you can't, you can't please everybody. Um, I, th- I do think that... He's like, been in by, the main, by the way, I think he's worked the main event of SmackDown every week since he's been back. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think they're talking like pay-per-views, but... I do think, like, by the time you get to SummerSlam, you should probably be looking at him challenging for the world title. But yes, for sure. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, if, if they're not doing that by SummerSlam, then I then I will have a problem with it. But right now, he's kind well, of getting his legs where back they're under. Going. Him. Yeah, like yeah. I, you know, there's I see people make an argument: Can they hold Brian versus Miz, which obviously would be the SmackDown title match? Can they hold that off till WrestleMania? I think that's best case scenario. I wouldn't blame them. You know, we're in kind of the era of pull the trigger when you can, you know, going back to when they did Braun and Brock and Cena and Reigns in the same pay-per-view. But boy, yeah, if they can hold it off, that's terrific. You know, maybe do Brian and Nakamura at SummerSlam or something. Yeah. What if 
Miz wins the briefcase and Brian beats Nakamura and Miz beats Brian. And there's your feud. And then Brian, you know, Miz avoids Brian. Brian wins the Rumble. And there's your WrestleMania main event. I, I think that's one of the biggest WrestleMania main events in a long time. I think that's the only way you can do it and wait until Mania. I think in this day and age, if I think that would it's work. Hard. Yeah, I think that would work pretty well. Otherwise, I think they got to do it earlier, and I'd like to see it like SummerSlam. But yes. well, d- yeah. doesn't it all come down to if Brian resigns in September? I mean, obviously they they can pull the trigger and you know do it at SummerSlam. That's also but true. Is, yeah, there's, that's... Is, yeah, there's there's no guarantee he resigns. God, I hope they have him under contract before SummerSlam, though. That would be really late in the game because. <laughs> What is it like September first at midnight it expires or something like that? He he was talking about that on uh, the Jericho podcast I mentioned because he talked about how with All In on September first, like he technically couldn't appear until like midnight, but like <laughs> if the show ran, went really late, I guess he could go and he could have appeared after midnight or he could come out like with a with a hood on and then reveal himself after midnight it's, it's that's Daniel Bryan or something like that. He talked about that on on the Jericho podcast, but I think he's staying. Yeah, I I, I can't imagine he's going to leave at this point. I, he definitely would have left if he didn't get cleared. Now I don't know why he would leave. So Especially if he's positioned in a high match on the card at SummerSlam, which he should be. People are going to not like this comment, but that's okay. If you listen to Daniel Bryan talk in these in these interviews he does, he likes to be challenged. Daniel Bryan going back to the indie scene is not a challenge for him. It, it's too easy for him. I think. To just go and have good matches against your favorites. I think there's part of Daniel Bryan that wants to prove his detractors wrong and be on top of WWE. Yeah, that's probably true. He talked about in the I, interview he, he wanted to work Mexico more. That was like one of the things he was looking at. And he was watching God a lot of Lucha. He was God watching a lot of Lucha this. on YouTube, he said, <laughs> trying to figure out people to work with in Mexico. That's one of the challenges out there for him right now. God bless that fucking man. <laughs> <laughs> that he's out there, you know, doing he's like, you know, what? and he's and he's just out there watching, you know, CMLL on YouTube and just like, yeah, I want to work these guys. Yeah. That well that's supposedly that was like the one thing he was looking forward to if he was gonna leave. That's really where he wanted mm-hmm. to work the most is Mexico. So mm-hmm. um so we do have to hit on this topic. Uh this is gonna be our last topic tonight, guys, because we're running out of time. Bobby Lashley and the couple of weeks he has had. Because, Kyle, when you came back to the States, like you said earlier, I think the first text message you sent us was something about this Lashley interview is heinous. No, that was the second one. That was the second one. <laughs> the first one was the coach fucking sucks. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that That is true. I, I am reading it. Uh, it was on Sunday. You said, back home, time to catch up on the sport of pro wrestling. Jonathan Coachman is the worst fucking professional announcer in history. <laughs> the Lashley <laughs> sit down is heinous. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. You guys, we all watch ESPN, right? And I'm sure a lot of our listeners do too. Do you know what that sit down, we'll get to the sisters segment from Monday in a minute, but that interview, do you know what it reminds it, it, it made me think that someone in creative watched one of those ESPN puff pieces they do on like Sunday countdown, you know, that's like a total throwaway and you're just like, yeah, whatever. Okay. I guess this is a nice guy. And they're like, let's just do that with someone, but they did it very poorly. Like Renee young is usually very good. And even it was just like this whole sister storyline. Is that really <laughs> the best thing you could come up with? Because if you remember the last time I did this, I was on the show. What did I say? I'm like, they need to do like a personality profile of Lashley. And okay, they did it. But my God, you know, talking about his three crazy sisters won the angle I would go with. <laughs> God, it was so bad. I couldn't and, believe when I was watching Raw that they actually played clips from it again. It was so bad. Like, oh my God, they're showing this again. It, it was just like, um, yeah, I don't know. It was just like, it felt like a cheesy, uh, what's the word? Just like vacant puff piece. Like, oh, this Bobby Lashley, he's just a 
good old family man and you should love him and i i don't think it made anyone necessarily care anymore about bobby lashley yeah so in that regard it was ineffective and then the segment on monday i'll go into that later i actually because i didn't watch it live and had read all the hideous tweets i was like prepared for it to be like the worst thing in the history of raw I actually wound up like not hating it nearly as much as I thought I was going to just because the bar was like so astronomically low. I was like, yeah, okay. It's a bad WWE segment, but it wasn't like, I didn't think it was like one of the worst things I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, Justin, you saw the Lashley interview a couple weeks ago first because you were texting me about it <laughs> and how bad it was. <laughs> yeah. Justin actually, that's right. Cause I wasn't watching Cause I think a Cavs game was on that night too. And I didn't watch that one live. Or no, I was getting ready to go. And um, yeah, Justin's like, what the fuck was this thing with Lashley I just watched? I'm like, oh, I can't wait to watch this. And that one was worse than I thought it was going to be. Yes. Yeah, And that's the thing with this is like watching that first interview is like, wow, this seems like a really big misfire. And then it got to the point where it's like, okay, well, maybe there's a plan like Oh, there's a plan. Th- this this might be like a four to five week thing they might have planned out, but I I just don't have confidence in that now after watching the segment this last week. It's just, ugh, I, I don't know. It was not the Jim Ross sit down with Mick Foley. I'll say oh, but then again, yeah. but then again, they weren't going for that. Like, I mean. <laughs> what the fuck were know, they going for then, Kyle? <laughs> They were going for a vacant puff piece. So, like, WWE wants to be ESPN. Okay? They want to be, like, what e- what, what ESPN is to sports, they want to be to, you know, sports entertainment. Okay? And it was just like, here's this guy. Uh, we don't really know what to do with him. You know, we, we need to do some personality things. So we're just going to, you know, we'll do what ESPN does. You know, oh, okay, we're going to interview this guy. Tell us some, you know, or, or like... Um, you know, on those late night talk shows, you know, when they just have the guests on and it's like the most canned fucking story. They're like, yeah, I'm going to tell this story. And, we're, you know, they let the guy know ahead of time or whatever. And they just go back and forth about whatever their publicist wants them to talk about. I, th- I just think it was like Lash is like, yeah, you know, I got these sisters and that's what it is. It, it wasn't good. No. And um, and the thing with money. So this is what I want to get into. So. Whose fault was Monday night? There's there's a correct answer to this question. It's one person. Who is that person? Uh, the writer who wrote the segment. Which it all goes through Vince in the end. So Vince McMahon. That's kind of technically true. But the, what do you think, Justin? I know you're gonna blame. <laughs> I know you're gonna blame Sami Zayn. I just know it. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna blame. Oh, Sami. Okay. I actually, I'm actually gonna give Sami Zayn a ton of credit. <laughs> okay. Believe it or not. Right. I, w- I was gonna say Sami Zayn w- has been the only saving grace of this entire mm-hmm. segment. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I God, I feel like I'm so put on he, the spot. I'm not good at this. The answer is Vince Russo, of oh, course, God. because if it's not good, the an- and, and it's wrestling, the answer should be always Vince Russo. So, do you know why we get segments like we got on Monday? Because what do, what is always romanticized? What era? The attitude era. Attitude. Okay, so I just listened to. I got thinking about this because I was listening to the Pritch, uh, Bruce Pritchard show, the the podcast with Conrad Thompson, when I was weeding my patio. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it made a terrible job go that much quicker. I was listening to the the Big Boss Man episode they did, and they were talking about the period where he had just come back. And they, one of the nights they were talking about like an individual raw and they were talking about that DX parody of the corporation. I'm sure you guys remember it. A lot of our listeners probably do too. It was pretty like famous thing, right? Mm -hmm. Triple H dressed as Vince and they did it. And they did a nation parody a few months before. Yeah. Okay. And and Pritchard's like, oh, you know, yeah, DX, you know, that was, that was some good shit. Have you guys watched those segments recently? Not recently, but I think the last time I watched it, I thought it was terrible. Trash. Yeah, racist they and are, terrible. Well, it's not. They're just not like like going back to the nation one. Like I watched that. I don't know why I watched, but I watched someone recently. It is you talk about cringeworthy. 
it's awful. But people got it got old. People like, oh man, that DX period of nation. That was when the WWE man. That's when there were stars. You know all the shit that Meltzer complains about. That's what you had. Oh, that was the era, man. People <laughs> were watching. They were engaged. That shit was terrible. Like Triple H going, oh, you know the Rock just got, the Croc just got in the bathroom. You should have smelled what he was cooking. Like that's bad. <laughs> that's really bad. And because that era is romanticized and. This is your life. Mm-hmm. The most overrated segment in the history of Monday Night Raw. A 30-minute cock tease for a Mick Foley heel turn that never happened. <laughs> I mean, seriously, this yeah. is your life is awful. Yeah. It, it's not It's not good. And you know, it, not to go full circle here, but that's when I watch wrestling nowadays, I always kind of keep in mind, like when I'm watching the Bl- Bludgeon Brothers, I'm watching with the eye that, this is not for me. This is for a younger audience. It's not and, for any audience, though. Like the Zane Lashley segment, I, 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 it was pretty much universally rejected. Yeah. It's my point with Russo is that WWE thinks, well, oh, people loved this. You know, they loved DX these DX parodies. Oh, this is your life. Highest rated segment. This is why I blame Vince Russo. Oh, th- this stuff works. Well, it may have drawn ratings 20 years ago, but people don't want to see that stuff in 2018 anymore, man. No. I don't care if you're Johnny New Japan or freaking Johnny Road Triple Z in for WWE. You, just no one wants it. And in front of a live crowd, that shit is death. Oh, it's yeah. really bad. Like it's re- it's made worse when you do it in front of a live crowd. No, that crowd Monday did not care for any of it at all. It was terrible. Just everything was flat. I, I will say this for Sammy Zane. It's funny you thought I was going to throw Sammy Zane on the bus. <laughs> Absolutely not. If there's one saving grace from that segment, it's that Zane stayed committed enough to it that he may his stock may have improved uh, in the creative team's eyes. Believe it or not, that's the weird thing with how WWE works. Because I think, you know, when the announcers kind of started burying the segment at the end, like that's a, a Vince thing, clearly. Like they obviously in the back were like, okay, this did not work. But Zayn stayed committed enough to it that I think they're going to be like, you know, I respect that. Out of him. Now you're coming around, Kyle. Sami Zayn and See, KO. Uh, well, okay. It, very funny, Mitch. I thought KO actually gave his, you know, again the the observer out to lunch. Um, it, it wasn't Melt. Meltzer went crazy about it on his radio show, and Hamlin, you know, started. You know, he went. He was apoplectic about the fucking Owens thing with like Stephanie saying, oh, you know, looking like get your hand off me. I thought Kevin Owens. Uh, that was his best presentation in months on Monday night. I thought him and Reigns had a great match to open that. I thought Mm -hmm. um, Owens getting heel heat by saying I like Roman Reigns was tricky and good to do. Um, I I, I liked Kevin Owens on Monday night. Yeah, Kevin Owens is amazing. I think... And when when you team with the great Jinder Mahal, of course you're going to (laughs) get across as a heel. Well... I've been harping on ever since he came back that I think WWE thinks Bobby Lashley is a way bigger deal than he actually is. And if this story hasn't buried him and he can actually, uh, and he, uh, if he can actually come word again, we got to, we got to well, watch with that buried. Okay. Word. But if he can actually come back from this terrible storyline, then maybe I underestimated him, but I, I don't think he's as big of a deal as they seem to think he is. Meanwhile, they got this guy like Kevin Owens on the roster who is just freaking amazing. Uh, this is the guy that should be getting that that kind of attention, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I certainly think... not Bobby Lashley. I'm sorry. He's, he's not he... a big deal. He's been gone a long time. Nobody watches Impact Wrestling. And since he's been back, his segments have been very, very bad. Well, th- to me, the hook is very easy with him. You know, because the MMA background, he's a big guy. Look, Brock, he comes in. Look, Brock Lesnar's not the only guy with MMA background around here. I am here, too, and I want Brock Lesnar. That's yeah. the hook. Yeah, but he he fought for, like, promotions nobody watches. That's yeah, but if you make him look big, I mean, it's fine. I mean, he can make him look big. I mean, he, and he could say, well, I won. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I won. I mean, he did improve. I mean, the tricky thing with Lashley is <laughs> they can't – number one, they can't really talk about his biggest match ever because Donald Trump was involved, <laughs> and they don't want to do that. And they can't talk about why he left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Because it was such a dicey situation. So, like, you know, they just made it seem like in these videos, well, he went off to pursue an MMA career. That's not really accurate. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has to do more with Michael Hayes. Yes. So, you know, that's kind of the tricky situation. They, they don't really want to talk about, you know, I mean, there's the MMA stuff, but, um, you know there's kind of this big hole you're right that if you don't follow things you know okay what is this big deal you know i mean they could go with the unfinished business route like all right i left here and you know i was on top i was i was so close to being on top and i you know i left now i want to be the top guy but they're not really doing that that you know to me he's a guy and this goes back to lesnar being such an albatross as champion there's so many guys who just <laughs> if they just would come out and have their stated goal being I want to be the universal champion that'd be fine but they don't do that because they don't want to distract from Roman <laughs> being the guy who has unfinished business with Lesnar and it's just why this whole thing is so frustrating like if, if Reigns was just the champion um, already and guys were just you know wanting to challenge Roman to be the top guy I, I, I think you'd have kind of a lot cleaner title situation. Well, it all, it all comes back to the fact that Brock Lesnar is a terrible, terrible champion and they got to get this belt off of him. I put a, mm -hmm. I put a poll out on my Twitter or my, my Twitter, our Twitter account the other night. And I asked who is a better champion, Brock Lesnar or diesel in 1995. And I got to say, I would much, much, much rather watch diesel as the world Ooh. champion. Ooh. Believe it or not, and that's saying a lot, but I would much rather watch Diesel because he was actually around versus the current incarnation of Brock Lesnar mm -hmm. Suplex I, City. I love that question. I would disagree and say Brock Lesnar just because of the opponents that he has available to him, but I, I, I get the point. Well, so, Yeah, it doesn't have to do with his opponents, but he himself. And it, I, think, I think Diesel was a terrible champion, don't get me wrong, but well, I would rather smiling. watch that. Smiling Diesel was very bad. We do not have enough time <laughs> to go into why he failed in that role. I, I mean, I don't think he was going to be great no matter what, but like, you know, Vince McMahon trying to turn him into a white meat baby face was very bad. Yeah. Well, there's, in my mind, Diesel was the better champion because he was around. He had different matches and good matches with different performers throughout that year, like Michaels and, and uh, Bret Hart, the Survivor Series. Brock's not around. He wrestles the same match every time out. He's ungodly boring. To me, he's one of the worst champions in WWE history. Right now. Just I just cannot stand it anymore. <laughs> you gotta get the spell no, off of him. It, it's too long and, and I, I I you know, the biggest argument for what you're saying is just how I feel it has stagnated the rest of the Raw roster. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's coming full circle because we always come Look, back to there's no champion. Like, I guess, well, Seth Rollins is the champion. The Intercontinental title is is the title in Raw now. God, is he on a run this year in 2018? I mean, who's better than Seth Rollins right now in WWE? Yeah. Nobody. I don't think anybody. Yeah, I mean, he is, you know, we all joked about that burn it down thing when they added that to his entrance. I I'm not even joking here. That thing has been like a huge help. The, the fans love chanting, burn it down. Like they do it during his matches and stuff. I'm telling you, burn yeah. it down Who is huge. Known? Yeah, yeah. Jimmy, burn it down. WWE fans, huge pyromaniacs. Who would have guessed? <laughs> you know, get the belt off Brock Lesnar. I don't. The rumor is that Extreme Rules, maybe Rollins is going to challenge Lesnar. If that actually happens and they do it then instead of SummerSlam, get the freaking belt off of, of Brock then. I don't care. Don't even book him for SummerSlam. He's not worth the ridiculous fee they're paying him, by the way. And just be done with the whole thing. It's funny because he flies in the face of kind of their approach with everyone else, where, you know, it's brand above everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's brand above any brand above individual. But they, you know, give him some, 
such a cushy kind of deal. Yeah. Get the belt yeah. off of him, get it on Rollins, and get Rollins in a title program for SummerSlam that people actually want to see. Okay. To me, and I thought, and they're not going to do it, obviously, because Reigns is not the money in the bank. But when I was kind of slogging through uh, some of that program, the, the previous two weeks when I was playing catch up after I got back, I started to think, you know, is the best story they can tell on Raw having Seth Rollins beat Brock Lesnar and have Roman Reigns having won the briefcase cash in and beat Rollins to make the whole thing WrestleMania 31 come full circle and then he goes heel. Yeah. Because that would that would be a way to get Roman Reigns as a heel. Oh yeah. And I think I think a Roman turn. I think a Roman turn on Seth is probably the best turn they could do. I agree with and, you. And then you can bring Dean Ant. When Dean is ready to come back, you can bring him into the equation. Because there there were some rumors uh, that they're thinking about doing like a shield triple threat at Mania. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well, Ambrose well, has to be healed, too. As of now, we're getting Roman Reigns versus Jinder Mahal at Money in the Bank. So you can great match. <laughs> great match did you guys see that photoshop where they like switch their faces so they put gender's face on roman's body and roman's on jenner i saw that on twitter seems, it was pretty funny seems racist <laughs> it was <laughs> it was funny it was funny okay i i'll tell you i thought gender i thought, gender, I thought he i don't know man i thought he looked kind of good i'm interested to see that match with seth next week man <laughs> all right well With that said, unless you guys have any closing thoughts, let's take this one into the sunset until next week. Anything else for the good of the cause? We might need to send Kyle back to Europe. He's a little too cultured now. (laughs) Fuck, man. The the Warriors lost. How about that? I'll add to that. I'm there. That always makes me happy. (sighs) Hope is alive then in Cleveland. Bring home the Larry O'Brien trophy again. The Uh, the, the old Larry O'Brien trophy, yes. A- Asterix, uh Celtics. Hmm. Man. Average L, man. Average L. Scary <laughs> Terry? Oh, and Scary Terry. Oh, that Absolutely. Is bad. That is bad. Yeah, it's bad that they're giving, without their two best players, they're giving the Cavs a run for their money. Oh, That's no. what's scary. Scary Terry? We're working our way right want, into our NBA podcast. If you want to upset Kyle, talk to him about LeBron leaving this summer. Not going to happen. He's a good <laughs> he's a good pers- close personal friend of mine. He's always put Cleveland first his entire career in LeBron James. <laughs> oh, next week's show is going to be interesting depending on how this series goes. So make sure you guys tune in. Check out the archive, toprobnation.com. And uh, leave us a rating on iTunes. Like I said, maybe we will do another t-shirt giveaway in the coming weeks. And uh, enjoy this pristine time, this golden time in professional wrestling. There's never been a time like it. Enjoy all the product that's out there. And uh, hopefully Vince McMahon enjoys counting his money. Hamlin stinks. (laughs) Catch you guys next week. Go Celtics.